I will now have the pleasure of uh, inviting our uh, next uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Luis Perez Breva, who will talk about inventing and building technology organizations. Is uh, okay. Let me. You can prep here. So, Dr. Perez Breva is a faculty director of MIT Innovations Team Enterprise. If you haven't checked his book in innovation, check it out. It's a great book. And also, Dr. Perez Breva can also be found you know, in our online education in several trainings. Dr. Perez Breva. I may need to pass it on the slides, or if technical support can come back and get my clicker to work, I would appreciate that. So now, hello. Uh, this is my first time in 22 months being in front of people and being able to walk around this much, right? <laughs> As opposed to being in front of a screen. So I appreciate your taking the risk. This is also the first time I appear unmasked, right, in front of a room. So today you get to see the secret identity of the superhero, I guess. So uh, I have a few ideas to share today. And what I want to share about is our work and what we've done over the last several years about how to build deep tech companies systematically, robust companies, in a way that may surprise you. We've done this at MIT. We've done this all over the world. And that's the topic of my talk today. Uh, as I try to get used to that, uh, my talking, let me tell you about what I would like you to have in the back of your brains today as we discuss. So, uh, we get to reclaim the word innovation, and we get to do so because I'm at MIT and I'm saying it, essentially, so I'm kind of pulling rank here. Uh, but we, did, we get to reclaim the word innovation because, you know, we now have seen what disruption means, we've seen what minimum viable product means, we've seen all those things. And so, as we look forward to next generation deals in the European Union, or to infrastructure bills in the United States, hi, uh, yes, go ahead, see it. Sorry for that. So uh, the question is, what do you want innovation to mean for you? And it's an important question because the infrastructure bill is calling for lab to market and many words. It's not calling for more minimum viable products. So here's my question for you to keep in the back of your hands as, as I develop the presentation. Uh, what does innovation mean now? Is it a skill set? Is it an ability to progress in the face of uncertainty? And now we actually know what uncertainty means. Uh, is it doing it with technology, whether it be new or old? Technology is a tool, not a product. Should we use it to solve problems that matter? To do it systematically, efficiently? Could we even aspire to do good and do well? Or are we still on the, vo on the fashion of calling it predictable disruption, minimum viable products, exponential ideas, user-centric design? So that's my question to you. You do get to decide which of those is. And today, I'm going to try to introduce you to some ideas to ponder about that. So, it's so okay, I'll just, we'll just improvise it. So um, now the real challenge for you in the corporate world really is making sense of all these litany of words. I'm not even going to read them to you. Venture Studio, Innovation Hub, Entrepreneur, Be More Innovative, Lab to Market. So what I'm going to talk about today is an idea that is that you can actually build deep tech super advanced companies, organizations, whether they be new or old, in a systematic and robust way. And that in order to do it, you do not need to start with some kind of exponential idea or whatever that means. And that's a really important idea I'm going to share with you. There's a process to do it. We've been doing it for years. Now, before I get ahead of myself, uh, I may sound contrarian. Some of the people in the room that know me know that I love to be provocative when I do these presentations. Uh, so I'm going to be a bit provocative, but I want you to know why I kind of, I think I've earned the right to be a little bit provocative. So I've spent the last, I'd say, 20 years obsessing with this one idea, which is how do you do innovation? To me, innovation means making problems that matter make sense, figuring, out, figuring those out, and then using technology that we also need to figure out to make the two things work. Solve those problems that matter that we did not even understand before, with technologies that may be new or old, but that need to be put together in a different way. We do this from organizations or startups. I don't care about that either. So I've obsessed about this. This is about how do you do innovation so that we are clear. It's not about how innovation threatens you. It's not about how you manage it or how it happens. It's about how do you actually do it? What does it take to do it? 
So I've done this in a number of places. So before I came here to tell you about this, I've done it in many places. It's some of the places where I've done this underneath. You see I've been interviewed on TV and in newspapers about the whole topic. Most importantly, I've done this in academia, where you see here, MIT. And I've also been done this in industry, in venture capital, and so on. Oh, look, this works. So I've actually acquired the skill and the ability to teach it myself by actually doing it. Throughout this experience, when you put it together, we've actually deployed these ideas over 30 times worldwide. And this is before we came here, so that even though I may sound contrarian, there is actually a backing of a lot of work behind that actually seems to imply there is a good other approach to building companies or organizations that use technology, highly innovative ways to solve problems that matter. And you can go systematically about it. The example that, I, that you know, I'm most known for is MIT iTeams. That's what we've done or how we've done it inside MIT. iTeams is a hybrid between a course and a program that runs across all of the schools. We routinely get students from all disciplines. So we are, in a way, a multidisciplinary entity inside a highly specialized place like academia. And what you see here is a bit of what we've done. We've tried this out, the method, with over 200 technologies. A lot of companies have emerged. This is a short list of about 40 companies have emerged from this endeavor over the last 10 years. And uh, we've seen technologies from all walks go to all industries. What's important for you guys to know is that this, more important than the technology that have come out, is that my students get to do this over and over again with their own ideas, with technology they search for. So this is actually a skill set they acquire. And the process thus far has yielded a lot of enduring new organizations. Over 90% of the things that come out of this program actually survive. And I want to emphasize this is true deep tech company creation. Or you can call it lab to market, or you can call it acceleration, whatever you fancy the word. But the point is, you can build companies systematically that solve problems that matter using technology as a tool, not a product. So um, if you guys are interested in this, as was said before, you should get the best book on earth. Uh, this one. Uh, people love it, I'm told. And, uh, and so now that I've said everything I've done and where these ideas come from, let me go directly at it and start to appear contrarian. There is two things that cause people these days to believe that what I said is actually hard to believe. And it's two ideas that got really ingrained over the last two, the last two decades that I want to just dispel for you. These ideas may work elsewhere, but for the purposes of innovation and building robust technology companies, they are actually dead wrong. Let me start with the first one. Failing fast. I'm sure you've all seen it. Right? This is, it is wrong. Right? No, you don't fail fast. You just don't fail. What I tell to my students, the observation is that the companies that survive do not survive by failing fast. They survive by actually failing to fail or put in a different way. They survive because they survive their bad ideas. So take this as a cue. There is a way to build companies systematically. And it doesn't start by failing fast. It starts by actually surviving your bad ideas. That's what you need to set yourself up for. So another way to put that is that you need to kill your idea before it kills you, effectively. And there's a way you can make that a process. The second uh, strange, wrong idea is this notion that was popularized by the lean startup ideology that talks about spending little by little and running small experiments. That's also wrong. Now, the reason why it's wrong should be very intuitive to all of us, which is spending little by little is the tried and tested way to waste money without noticing. So which one is it? Right. I am very provocative this way because I need you guys to stop assuming this is a dogma and challenge it within your own organizations, the same way we've challenged it with our students. Sometimes it does apply, but it applies far less times than people think. So why does it have this great appeal? Well, you can imagine it if you think about the notion of risk. So if you don't know anything about anything and you have to allocate money, then your best bet is to allocate as little as you can to as many things as you can and see what grows. Right? But that strategy, which is essentially what this thing is telling you to do, um, stops being effective and efficient the moment you know something. And most importantly, for the perspective of doers or actually sophisticated investors, 
it's forcing you to assume all the risk. The investors would not be assuming it, or whomever spends little by little is not assuming it. So as an investor, a sophisticated investor, or as a doer, what is it that you need to do? Well, the answer is very simple. You should spend as much money as necessary so that you don't waste any at the next scale. Or put another way, you should get to proof with the money you have, however much it costs, so that you know it's worth continuing afterwards. Spending little by little does not get you there. So those are the two ideas I need you to challenge today. And you may think, well, this doesn't apply to me, so let me show you the next slide, the process. Sorry, I was trying to click here. A process that I'm sure you're sort of familiar with. This is a busy slide, so we'll spend some time in it, and I'll just explain how things look like. So this is what you've heard before in many cases. We've all been through this. You may have even pitched this way. It's a process that's built on those two ideas, fail fast and spend little by little. It starts with a pitch and a presentation. Some people prepare their fancy idea and they present it. It follows with a due diligence. The whole process from pitch to the end of the due diligence may take a good eight to nine months. Then people do decide to invest. And then what follows is a sequence of investors investing little by little, right? And a long path through lots of years of raising funding before you get to somewhere. So those two ideas lead to this process. This process might actually work, but I want you to realize that this is a very general process in the sense of what we, we of the, sorry, in the sense of all the many places we have adopted this process in. Every call for proposals follows the exact same process. Every idea selection process inside corporations follows the same exact idea. And notice that this makes sense only when your business is to take an idea from here, put some money, and make it sellable to the next guys. So this is not the project you use to solve problems. That's not what this is designed to do. This is designed to actually uh, follow or comply with the fiduciary responsibilities of investors that need to return their money on a given time frame. It is perfectly OK uh, to do and to follow it. It's just don't try to use it to solve problems that matter, because that's not what it was designed to do. So this is the process, the ideas that are wrong. So let me push forth the idea that you probably came, to me, came here to hear me talk about, which is what if there was another way? What if there was a way to meaningfully test and de-risk innovation concepts? Not just little by little, but meaningfully. Could we test perhaps 10 concepts for the capital it takes today to fail at one predictably over a long period of time? Could we use that new skill to justify more ambitious projects? Could we even make it affordable to do good and do well? These are important questions. The private wealth community in Boston is thinking about this. How do we actually get to use technology to do good and do well? Not-for-profits have started to gain interest in the idea of technology as a force for good, so that there might even be more money available than just venture capital. So can we actually give them another process that looks for problems, not just for compliance in returns schedules? So that's going to require a different mindset. It's going to require that we think about things in a slightly different way. And if we had a class, I would show you all kinds of things. If we were in my Zoom setup, I would be pointing to strange slides with my fingers. Now I'm going to do a really quick sample of some of the examples that will help you acquire, or at least see where we're coming from in this new mindset. The most important thing to realize is that we're talking about problem solving, but for real. So I'm sure you all went to math class at some point in your early lives. Maybe some of you are still doing it because you just like it. I do. So uh, in math class, you probably solved problems, and you thought you were problem solving, but that's pretend place problem solving. The reason why it's pretend play, it's because you know already the problem statement that was crafted by a person that probably knows how to solve it. That's a hell of a lot of information implicit there. But in reality, figuring out the problem takes as much iterative work as figuring out the technology does. And so how do you approach this thing? You need another mindset. So I'm going to give you three examples. First one, I'm going to ask you to I don't know how we're going to do this, because in normal times I would have asked you to shout, but that's not appropriate in COVID times. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a picture of a technology. And I want you to imagine that you just stroll into a corridor of MIT, and you see this thing appearing in front of you. And you probably see a demo, but you don't understand the word. So it doesn't matter that I can't demo it to you. You would get the exact same outcome, which is something that looks strange. 
So I typically ask in classrooms, do you know what this is? And people respond, yes. And they give me all kinds of examples. I'm going to just relay back to you. They tell me that it could be something from a fishing rod. They tell me it could be a music box. I've heard some people talk it's a pencil sharpener, uh, a motor, a piston inside the motor. I've heard all kinds of things. And I say, well, that's great. It's none of those things, right? Moving on. Uh, there's another thing I showed them next, which is this slide. And I asked them, what do they think this represents? And they respond, invariably, most of them respond, a laser or some kind of laser. And I tell them, that's our problem. That there is our problem for how most people think about innovation. Because this is the first laser. The laser you saw when you had no clue for what, what this was going to solve. And every new problem is going to look exactly like this, like something that's kind of out of place, not clear, and whatnot. And by the time you get here, right, everybody has figured everything out. There's still lots of good stuff to do, don't get me wrong, right? And we can always invent more, but a lot of the uncertainty has been cleared. So how do you approach the world when what you have looks like the first slide, not the second? And most importantly, how do you get over the bias that most people kind of tell you stories of the product that survived instead of telling you the story of the organization that was built. And that's a really important distinction, right? Because in hindsight, the storytelling of the laser talks about this great invention that was doomed to happen. In foresight, a random person pulled together some, actually, let's figure out what that person did. So the beginnings look like this. This is from an interview that you can find online in which the inventor of the laser was interviewed. And I love this example about technology because even though it's old, it's from the 50s, new laser stuff is coming alive every day. Chips that use lasers instead of electricity and whatnot. So this is very relevant today, and yet it epitomizes the same problem that was there already in the 50s, but it makes it easy to understand because you understand the context. There is something you don't understand today that in a very short period of time might become a great innovation that changes your life. And you might be a part of it. And you don't need to understand anything because no one did back then in the first laser. Actually, so this is what the first laser looked like. This was not a story of a product. This was a story of a person inside the huge research laboratory. And this is a quote from him when he was interviewed in, I believe it was NBC in the 90s. And you can read what he says. The main point is that one of the things he tried to do was use stuff that was already lying around. Some parts came from a photography catalog. Some parts he just procured via the phone. The rest he just machined. Now pause for a second. The first laser ever, that great invention, is a pet project in an industrial laboratory using parts that were repurposed. To me, that was revealing. Because one, we would not know what it was good for, but it was relatively easy to produce. Actually, with Amazon and two or three day delivery because of the pandemic, you might actually get it, right? And start inventing right away. But this is totally different. It's not an exponential idea. It's not a minimum viable product. There's no product here. It's someone set on solving a problem. There's one more example I want to share for this different mindset, which is this one. The story goes that in the 1970s, a bunch of lunatics or visionaries, depending on who you talk to, uh, fleeted a boat, sorry, tried to convince the world that the planet was in danger by actually using billboards. That did not work. Mental note, marketing is not almighty. So then they decided that the way they needed to do it was fleet a boat, a fishing boat, which they could do because they actually got money from a benefic concert. Uh, and then go and stop the United States from testing nuclear bombs near Alaska. Because that's the normal Sunday idea anybody would have, of course. It's not even exponential. It's just preposterous. So they did it. They had a ham radio with them. They relayed back to shore everything that was happening to them. Five days later, they were arrested. They never came even close to stopping the United States. The fact that they even thought they could is kind of like, what? Uh, now, the interesting part about this story is that when they finished, when they came back, they realized that this had worked. People had actually understood that the planet was in danger. And they said, wait, maybe there is a recipe here. 
not the billboards, but the kind of getting about and going and you know, annoying a great superpower for a bit and making it visible in the press. And so they decided to found an organization which they call Greenpeace Foundation in honor of the boat. I like this story because it contains technology. Ham radio was rather new. You can this technology as a tool, not as the product, but it's a story of an organization, fundamentally. It's organizational building, problem solving. They had to figure out everything, how to get the money, how to whatever. They probably had a lot of things, but it's a story of organizational building. So the mindset of trying to communicate, oh, one more thing. Uh, even the idea wasn't new. It turns out in the 60s, some other people with a different boat had tried to stop the United States from testing a nuclear bomb near somewhere else, right? And they had also been arrested, but I guess they didn't have the radio, right? Or the thought of progressing the radio. Now think about these stories. What do they tell you about the way in which we can get started innovation, and how do they tell us about making this process? So there's two, two ideas contained in these examples. One is that you start with what you have. Nothing is new. I've shown you three examples, and nowhere there was even a need to have a good idea. Right? Uh, and the other part is that the story you end up living is one of an organization born out of exploring the problem, a problem that's actually unknown. The storytelling that talks about the product or how visionary they were, that happens later. But it's not how the one you live, it's the one you tell. And it's important to distinguish between these two stories because when you open up a book that tells you lots of stories from hindsight, you don't really know what they are actually tasking you to do. The stories might be cool. The book might be incredibly worth reading. There is lots of these that are incredibly entertaining. It's just science fiction. Right? It's not, it did not happen that way. There's no need for, for telling. So back to the question. What if there was a way to meaningfully test and risk innovation concepts with this new mindset? I'm going to ask you the question also in, with an example, so you see what I mean. You may have heard of companies that get started in venture studios or incubators or accelerators and may wonder what's the difference between them. So there is two extremes they can hear about. Over here is Uber, a company that was founded around 2009, has had global impact, went public in around 2019, so in 10 years. It's not deep, deep tech but it does use technology. And it needed $24 billion raised before IPO. That's a company that was, according to the law, started in some kind of incubator process. At the other extreme, you have Moderna, which we know about because it's close by. It's from a friend of ours. right? And, uh, and all this information is public. You can go to the SEC and find it yourself. Uh, this company was founded around the same time as Uber, has had global impact. Um, it IPO'd in 2018. This one happens to have extremely deep tech that they actually even invented along the process. And it only needed $2.7 billion raised pre-IPO. The main difference is that that starts in one of the things that are called venture studios or incubators or whatnot, and flagship pioneering has a systematic process to create companies. So even for this, there's just at least one example that shows you there's got to be a way. So what's this way? Mm. It starts by understanding the two different modes of company creation and organizational creation. I'm not talking about startups anymore. I'm talking about building a technology organization, whether you already have another organization and you're building it within, repurposing the one you have, or whatever, that's a choice that you can do. So on the left here, you have the standard paradigm, find the entrepreneur, find the idea, shepherd the idea. And this is where you get all the venture studios, accelerators, incubators, and whatnot. This is a guessing game. This is the game that requires you to believe spending little by little will work because you don't know anything. You can tell I'm not particularly fond of that model, by the way. So this is the other one, the one I've been spending 20, 50, almost 20 years researching and doing and building in my own companies, outside of MIT and inside MIT, until I persuaded myself there was a way of doing it. Uh, and my friends IAPI have been with me all along, actually, all throughout the process, right? Uh, so it's inventing organizations. Literally invent the organization that will help us solve a problem. But it's also about recycling and repurposing what doesn't work, so that there is no waste. I'm talking about an efficient way to innovate. 
systematically and efficiently. We're talking about conceiving, developing organizations, and discovering the problems as we go. And this is a really important part of the problem solving mindset I was telling you about. You actually don't know the problem you're solving at, at the outset. That's not the way, it's not like in math class. You need to figure out the problem iteratively as well as the company, the organization, the technology, and essentially everything. But it's a lot of fun. It's actually also much easier than people think. So to give you a sense of what the method looks like, I'll show you one example, and then I'll show you the process we follow. And the example is more of an illustration of what you, the way to think about this. So this is a map from about 1,000 years ago, give or take. And this map corresponds to the mental model that people back then had about what the world looked like. We know this is wrong, the same way that I know little by little spending is wrong. Right? The reason we know this is wrong is because we have already seen this. And now, in hindsight, we do know that the other map was missing a number of continents, got the proportions wrong, even the shape was kind of not all there. Right? And so you would say, well, it's the wrong map. But what's interesting about that map is that that map reflected the mental model that people back then had, meaning the people that discovered the map above, right, or the people that took the picture from the map above benefited from the fact that the people that only knew the map below were able to discover, I mean, go around the world and discover all new opportunities. And that's true for the people from this map and from people with other maps. What I'm trying to say is that the mental model that you have when you go out and discover uncharted territory is the old mental model. That's the way you get started. You don't get the answer. You find and discover the answer. I find that the way to understand this mindset best is to actually quote from A.C. Clark, the sci-fi writer that um, you may have heard about. He wrote in the 1950s three laws of prediction that go as follow. When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, they're more likely or very likely right. When they state that something is impossible, they're very likely wrong. That's law number one. Law number two says the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And the third one says any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So let me read this in reverse for you to draw the analogy with innovation. We love innovation because it does look like magic. That's what inspires us about, that, about it. So that's the third law. Right? We're scared of it because it implies discovering a whole new area that we are not comfortable with. That's the second one. And the first one is that, essentially, that as you go through it, the whole process is going to require that you are wrong essentially all the time, or at least told that you're wrong all the time. So you need to be productively wrong while discovering an area that's uncharted so that you eventually get to something that others in hindsight, we'll call magic. That's the mindset. So we can go systematically about this business of being productively wrong. This is the process we follow. And I'm going to show you a bit of it in slow motion. There is three main phases of it. We start by making things robust, mapping and scoping out the problem. That takes about a couple of months. We call this exploration. But this is words matter. I'm not talking about exploration just like, hey, let's Google a few things around and put together a few numbers for the market, and then that's it. We meaningfully explore potential organizational hypotheses where we are persuaded that there is an attractiveness to the organization, we can invent the technology if it doesn't exist, and we know it solves the problem we care for, at least a part of it. Once we're we are persuaded those organizations are worth exploring or going further than just the exploration, we go into the second phase, which is the risking and stress testing. And we do what you would expect to do, which is like we have this great idea, let's kill it. And if it survives, then we're good. And we go about it in a very organized manner. We determine all the things that need to be true for this organization to survive, and we actively, not with PowerPoint, actively design experiments or actions. They could be technological experiments, they could be inventing technologies, or it could be just going to talk to certain key opinion leaders or whatnot. We design these actions to try to demonstrate to ourselves that the idea, the set of ideas, have no merit. And we try really hard. And we spend about a year at that. By the time we're done, two things could happen. We either succeeded, we killed the idea, or we failed, and we did not manage to kill the idea. If we kill the idea, I can guarantee you it will be the most thorough and inexpensive way to kill an idea. And you'll get actual real information from it. 
It will only take you a year. And not only that, you'll be saving an enormous amount of money and time and talent that you would have spent failing at it little by little over the span of five years, which is the average little by little experimentation takes to demonstrate something is bad. So you save a lot of money along the way. But again, here the size is not about how big the investment is. That's not interesting. What's interesting is how much value do I get out of each experiment? And you want to get more value than the money you put in. And that requires some planning. If we, succeed, if we fail, meaning if the organization survives everything we throw at it, then maybe there is something to this. Most interestingly, because it survives everything we could imagine, would make it die at the next scale. We can actually proceed to scale this thing up. And so that's what we do. We take it to scale up, and that's where you get to the last step. So that sounds great. I, I think it works. We've seen it work in a number of domains. It's incredibly easy to implement. There's lots of details to be worked out, for sure. But the general idea works, um, except for one thing. I promised to you a talk about a robust method, which I did. I promised to you talking about an efficient method, and I didn't. Because for this to be efficient, we need to figure out what to do with waste. So this is part of what we're working on right now. Um, we need to repurpose and recycle insights produced along the process. So the next time these insights are needed, they cost less money. That's how you build efficiencies and economies of scale for your innovation. And that's why you want to think of this as a factory in some ways, rather than just as a one shot at goal kind of idea. What you truly are building is a lot of insights that will make every next endeavor cheaper. So with this, you get the whole, the whole idea. And in order to make it easier, oh, sorry, I forgot to hit, hit click. So this is the inside. That's why the faces would look, as, look like you could not see one element there. So let me compare these with the other method and the other mindset I shared with you now, I mean, at the beginning of today. This is an important comparison because I've been telling you that I look provocative and contrarian and whatnot. And, um, I've shown you one method at the beginning. I've, showed, I've told you it doesn't really work for this activity. It works for other activities. It's designed for another purpose. It's good to see it alongside with this so you understand what I meant. I have no interest in criticizing the method below. I just want to point out that the method below is an intermediary model. It's a business model of people that are passing some ideas over to the next person. Well, as the method I've talked to you about and the process I've talked to you about is a method that actually helps you manage the entire life cycle of your innovations. It gives you end-to-end -end oversight. Most importantly, it strives to produce no waste. You know when you will have an idea. You don't know when this idea will be timely, or when the events will really idea to have been worthwhile. That's why you need to recycle your insights in some way. At the end of the day, remember that what we're trying to do is reflected in this slide, right? We're trying to discover all those big pieces of land that are next to land that we already know is there where there is ample opportunity for not just one company, for plenty. So I'm going to wrap it up for you guys. Uh, and I think I'll do it on time. Uh, we've spoken about a lot of things. This slide is only here to let you know that there is more to the method than just those fancy uh, workflow. The whole universe of things we could be talking about, about how you do this, is contained in that slide, at least at the high level. And, um, and because I've spoken about so many things, I think it's valuable for me to kind of try to wrap this up in, in the form of a few principles so that you guys can go back and check. So there's, we've spoken about a lot of things, but effectively the four things that have guided my composition of this presentation are reflected in the screen now. You can read about them. I posted on LinkedIn about a month ago an article in which I explained the whole notion and the principles. So if you like this, you can certainly go LinkedIn, befriend me or not befriend me, but read the paper. Uh, and, 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 and join the conversation. These are the four principles. The first one is that it is irrational to fail, to fail in ways that could have been predicted. It really is irrational. Spending little by little does not protect you from that. That's why this is one of the principles. Two, in the face of uncertainty, diversification is the only rational choice. In practice, this means that starting a company with just one idea and sticking to it might actually be the highest risk idea you do along the way. And so if you have a method to avoid that, you do, would do well to perhaps explore it. The third thing is that, and this is something that's widely unknown, the most powerful asset of, a, of an idea, the most powerful asset of a technology, even our technology is at MIT, and I have to explain this to my students every semester, is that technology and ideas are reshapable. 
you can work with them. Think about this, this is a great news. It's not about a single product that's fixed with a few tweaks. You can change the entire technology to suit the problem as you discover what the problem is. That's incredibly important to the best of my knowledge. The only place where we've actually been able to teach this consistently over years is here at MIT in these programs. The rest of the world still imagines lab to market as passing a technology over a fence. The last is that unless recycled, failed ideas produce waste. They pollute your thinking and they essentially waste talent. And so whatever you do as an innovation process needs to make sure that nothing gets wasted. That doesn't mean that everything has an immediate purpose, but rather that it is prepared for repurposing. So that's all I had to you for you today. This is just my way of letting you know what I'm working on right now. I'm obsessed taking these ideas further to the idea of doing good and doing well. Sharing technology as an instrument so anybody can actually get into this process and we go all advanced. And most importantly, I'm starting to think about how one does this outside to build organizations conceived to solve those problems and profit being first and best at it. If any of these things are close to your heart, by all means, reach out. If you just want to address questions, by all means, reach out. This is my contact information and all the things I do in my everyday life. And um, with this, what I would like to do is, since I've shared so many provocative ideas, we have about 10 minutes to discuss, I would like to ask you to correspond and, and give me your reaction to those ideas so we can discuss in 10 minutes and get the conversation going. So there is, I think the way I need to do this is I need to kind of address questions from here. So uh, the most voted one is the Moderna, is the Moderna, if the Moderna way is clearly the most efficient way of creating innovative organizations, why do you think this is usually the exception and not widely seen? This is a phenomenal question. <laughs> it's a phenomenal question. It takes a while for us to get out of our normal paths. Right? Most people you tell the story of Moderna to, and by the way, I have no personal association with Moderna so that it's clear. Right? But I just find it to be a phenomenally great example. I would call this uh, the systematic innovation way of which Moderna might be one example. Well, it takes a big event for you to actually finally recognize an example for what it is. Now we all love Moderna. What makes Moderna great is that many things, but one of them is that they managed to compete with all the established pharma by being the new kid in the block. So think about it. They did the whole thing. Uh, development of the vaccine, uh, manufacturing, they took this to, to, to the world, they distributed, they did the regulatory path, so they did it all. BioNTech wasn't able to do it all. They had to partner with Pfizer, right? So they did all of it in just 10 years, right? That's quite remarkable when you think of it. And they are the only player that's going at it at all, I mean, alone. So, but it took a pandemic for you to even know that Moderna existed, right? And it takes a person at MIT that knows the story really inside in an event that's private for me to tell you that that company did not start the way most people think companies get started, which is like random entrepreneur walking to the door of VCs with a nice pitch. But rather it started a whole other process you had even never heard of. So it takes a while for us to realize and to spread the word. It's taken us years to even come up with a way to understand how, why this works and make it work. But now we do. Now it's easy to explain. To me, it's... Moderna has personally has simplified my life enormously because it's made explaining the process so much easier. Now we have an example. So let's just say that this way is more efficient, but we just invented it. You come to MIT conferences because you see the latest thing, right? So we just invented this way of doing things. It's really new. It's just 10 years in the making and lots of experimentation. In the same way that you see Moderna, I sort of shared with you about 40 examples early in my presentation today of companies that have come out of the exact same process. So, okay, next question. Can I please talk a little bit more about systems that effectively recycle ideas? What do they look like? How do they operate? So that's still work in development in many areas. The basic idea is if you are able to connect technologies with problems and you're able to somehow sort technologies you've explored with problems you've explored or context where you have explored those technologies, you can build a very simple database by which you could actually associate technologies with problems or you could search by problem and see all the technologies that have been associated with that problem. That alone would give you an enormous advantage because you can, and you can check, you can go to the technology licensing office or talk with, with the good people at ILP and see how hard it is to even 
make the connection between what you care for and which technologies might be out there, new or old, that might actually be usable for you. It takes a process. So the, at the very basis level, just having this database that connects problems with technologies would be useful. And notice I'm talking about technologies, not disciplines. Specific technologies, that's what you want, because we don't think in disciplines, we think in problems. So we need to have a mapping of that kind. Um, you can add AI layers to that, that's my other expertise. You can add a process by which people explore those technologies in more detail. Even the process I shared with you, that starts with the exploration, can create those links between problems and technologies in such a way that creates the database for you. And so over time, what you have is a system that allows you to quickly search for technologies that might be relevant to the problems you care for. Uh, and I'm super happy to take this question uh, you know, another day and, and even give more detail, but hopefully Anonymous will be happy with what I said. Uh, Yes, so there's another question. The first one says, can your model of building new organizations work for organizational innovation and the evolution inside existing companies? What are the challenges? Absolutely yes. I've insisted from the beginning that even though some of the examples are about startups, the only thing that's interesting about startups is that they stop being startups. And when you think about what I've discussed, nothing of what I've said actually requires that you be a startup. I've talked about repurposing what you have. If you are already an existing organization, there's a lot of departments in your organization that already do things that are only a near miss away from being the thing you need them to do in the future. So the organizational process of innovation inside an existing organization would actually teach you how repurposable your own organization is, the components, the parts of your organization, so that you could use it to explore different problems. It can be used for that purpose. We've set it up inside the organizations for that purpose, and it does, it does work. The key challenge, as with everything in a big organization, is finding the time to develop the connection with the organization, time to kind of work through having a champion inside that believes in it, and eventually making it work, right? But once you have all those pieces in place, it can be adapted, and we've seen it work in several organizations. Um, can we replicate this suggested process in our bureaucratic internal corporate venture? Well, I, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can attest to that, particular corporate venture process in that organization to be bureaucratic or not. So I'm not sure I can give you details about that particular context, but the idea, yes. But there's one trick that I don't we've caught throughout my presentation. I haven't really spoken about ventures at all. I've spoken about solving problems with technology. So most of the venture processes, most of the venture studios, most of the corporate ventures have set their eyes into creating companies. And the reason why that's different is not just a matter of words, is that you decide that you want to create a company, you create the company, and then you want to fund that company. Well, as I decide I want to solve a problem, I try to solve that problem, I may create five companies or none. Right? I have not constrained my view to having just that one company. The moment you constrain your view to having that, just that one company or that one venture, you start to get into the mindset of little experiments and failing fast because you are deciding essentially to constrain your endeavor in that particular way. So a lot of what we've actually been teaching, even our students here at MIT, is that if a venture is to emerge, it will be the conclusion of your analysis, not the foregone conclusion at the outset. In my experience, most established companies think of innovation as magically creating a new business that will provide top revenue and get go. How do you create the right, is there more to that question? Oh, the right expectations, thank you. So um, I, I agree, most people think of innovation as product design, and then you just create a new product, there will be lots of revenue. You know, sometimes you need to accept that your organization just doesn't like to do innovation, that's fine. It's not something that everybody must do. Right? The people that don't do it, according to Christensen, may actually die to, I mean, not the people, but the companies may actually die to, an, uh, to a challenger. But that is a perfectly acceptable progress. Not every organization survives all along. Some organizations prefer to stay the way they are until their business runs out. So once you decide that you really want to innovate, the way to think about this is to think about it as, I mean, and the way I like to think of it is as, as an internal process in the organization. So instead of thinking of this as a, I'm going to produce new, new lines of revenue that puts all the wrong stresses in the activity, right? Somehow you're banking on, essentially the, the, the person that asked the question did it right. Um, you're banking everything on having had the right idea that can produce lots of money from the get-go and you have nothing. So that's a very risky proposition. 
instead of doing that, you know, I want people to imagine innovation the way they imagine finance. Finance doesn't have to justify their existence through top line revenue. Why not? Because they're a fundamental infrastructure component of the company. That's how you know the flows of money. That's how you know where the position of the company is. So they exist and they have a reason to be because they are the backbone of that company today. Not tomorrow, today. Innovation is your backbone for tomorrow. You need to actually understand your current assets and the way they might be moved around so that in the future you may need to recombine them in a different way. And when you're actually thinking about innovation, it's easier to think of it in terms of a, as a function that is teaching you how to repurpose your company in myriad different directions as needed so you can react faster rather than think of it as the, the magical uh, golden egg producing machine that it hardly ever is. Um, one more question that says, what are the, key, the idea framework high level steps? Well, I showed uh, most of them in one of my slides before. Um, high level is you start by diversifying your problem. You meaningfully look not for one way to solve it, but for two, two three, four, five ways to solve that particular problem so that you don't fall prey to any of the biases. Second, you come up with a list of all the things that need to be true for each of those ideas or versions to survive. And then you create a company that actually, whose sole purpose is to actually test each of one of those truths. You don't create a company to see whether one of the ideas was good. You create a company to try to destroy all of the ideas. Now, of course, you cannot destroy all of these ideas, but just like looking at, at the sky, you build equipment, apparatuses, a team, and so on to try to kill the ideas. You invest money in trying to actually kill the idea, real money, not 50K seeds. That doesn't get you to prove anything. But you don't need multi-million dollars investments either. In about a year, for about less than a million dollars, you can actually kill most of these ideas, but you can also repurpose all of those things. If you already have an organization, the price tag might even be lower because you can repurpose what you already pay for. So in a way, that gives you an advantage. So you do that, and then the rest is what I explained. If you manage to successfully kill all those ideas, not only did you learn a lot along the process, and it's actually based, fact-based information, you saved yourself millions of dollars. And you get to try again, 10 times, right? That's the statistic I've seen for the price it would have cost you to fall enamored with one idea and then take it the normal other process way. So uh, I think that's all we have in questions. Thank you so much for having me today. And please reach out if you need to, if you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Perez Brevo, thank you so much for the, your presentation. And I have to tell you that I was until 15 minutes ago one of those, the evangelist of the uh, I mean, fail fast framework. <laughs> so I have a lot to discuss with my therapist on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, I was not ready for that.